thinking of the Dead Sea Scrolls, we I'm, I'm trying to think of how to phrase it. Looking back at uh, Saint Jerome, what I what I would very clearly I think by now uh, it's very clear he was incorrect, he was wrong. Uh, whether we want to call it a major blunder or whatever, uh, he was clearly wrong when he argued that um, that the Hebrew original had been preserved only in one rabbinical tradition found in the Masoretic. Um, would you agree, Dr. Bergsma, and I'd like to get your thoughts afterwards, Gary, that um, his disparaging of the Septuagint, it's clearly been shown to be erroneous. Do the Dead Sea Scrolls show us that St. Jerome, despite be being an amazing saint and doctor of the church, was clearly wrong on this particular issue? On the issue of the preservation of the, uh, the best Hebrew text? There we go. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, what I, you know, I just, you know, from the perspective of a professional biblical scholar, what I would say is, you know, the, the, the uh, a common, you know, perception amongst, amongst most, most Bible scholars now is that, you know, in the Pharisaic tradition, which eventually leads to the Masoretic text, um, there, there was not exactly a conscious choice about which form of the Hebrew they preserved. So, um, you know, again, with some books, they preserved a shorter form and some books they preserved slightly longer form. And that, that seemed to have just been kind of the process of tradition and so to speak, accidental, you know, uh, rather than like getting together and debating and actually saying, oh, we're going to specifically take the shorter form of Daniel, but the longer form of Ezekiel. Uh, most Bible scholars think that was a, a bit, you know, of they they, just, they had they, they took the text that they had the most of or had the best access to, and and they worked with that. Same with the Septuagint. It, it's you know generally felt that that wasn't exactly a conscious choice on the part of the Septuagint authors. Now, as persons of faith, we can see the hand of God in all of that. Um, <clears throat> You know, uh, in, in a sense, there's there's something symphonic and beautiful about the preservation of God's word uh, in in these multiple forms. Just like when you have a, a stereoscope, when you look at it, a kid that as a kid that gives you a three dimensional image. So sometimes there's a certain beauty about how God's word has been preserved in the Hebrew and in the Greek, and you get uh, some different dimensions and some different nuances that, to it that, that are very rich. Um, some, some people, and I, I encounter this a lot, uh, you know, point to the fact that in the Septuagint, there are certain uh, Messianic prophecies that are not as clear, at least, in the Hebrew. And they feel that, you know, maybe there was an agenda there. Um, that's true. There are some passages of the Old Testament that, are more strikingly messianic when you read them in the uh, Greek, uh, ancient Greek translation. But at the same time, there are also some striking messianic prophecies that, so to speak, pop more in the Hebrew itself, in, in uh, you know, what's preserved in the Masoretic text. So it, it's not just either or. For example, in Psalm 2, Psalm 2 in the Hebrew concludes with a very striking messianic statement that, um, that one should uh, kiss the son, lest he be angry and you perish in the way. And in the context of the psalm, the son that you should kiss is the son of David, who's also the son of God by virtue of the Davidic covenant. And it's a very powerful statement of the need for every human being to recognize the, the lordship of the son of David, who ultimately is Jesus Christ. So I, I like that. I like that reading in the Hebrew that that particular one doesn't come out as clearly in uh, the Greek. But on the other hand, Isaiah 714 is more striking in its uh, Greek formulation. So, you know, I'll, I'll throw those two cents into it. And I'm interested in Gary's perspective because he's done such a, amazing scholarship on, uh, on, on this question and the Deuterocanonicals and so on. Well, thank you, Doctor. Yeah, the checks in the mail, so thank you for <laughs> that unneeded endorsement. But uh, yeah, uh, that's uh, you know, Qumran is such a enormously enlightening event because we realize that uh, you know, which was unavailable to us before the 1940s, that there were 
several different versions of texts that were in circulation in the first century. Um, and, uh, and like we mentioned earlier, that there are parts of the Septuagint that seem to be a literal translation of a lost Hebrew tradition. Like uh, also the Theodosian, you know, we found out that there are proto-Theodosian texts that were there hundreds of years before Theodosian was born. So <laughs> it's like, oh, okay, so this has been around for a while. Yeah, um, yeah it, it, with Qumran, what I think is really interesting, I'm a big fan of Immanuel Tov, uh, the Jewish mm. scholar. And he almost advocates a kind advocates a kind of um, I don't know what you would say like a parallel text that the scholar ought to look to where you have the Masoretic text you have the Septuagint and you have selected Dead Sea Scroll text and to compare those different text traditions to work from instead of going straight to the MT or the Masoretic Hebrew text which had been kind of like that was the go-to source of scholarship in fact. Right. Throughout history, the MT was considered, you know, the Hebrew Bible, right? right? But after Qumran, now there is a much more openness to investigating Septuagintal text and also Dead Sea Scroll text. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, yeah, do you have any thoughts on the rewritten scriptures in the Dead Sea Scrolls? Any ideas what those are? Yeah, no, I think those are kind of like uh, ancient amplified Bibles um, where they are yeah uh yeah, that's good. right writing writing down the scriptural narrative but it but like the targums i think that it's like it's an early form of what we have in a more developed form in the targums where the oral tradition is being um woven into uh the um the written text um which which helps us to understand how the bible was being read uh, you know, it's it's in the Targums, for example, that we find out that, you know, ancient Jews by and large just assumed that Melchizedek was Shem, the son of Noah, in Genesis 14, uh, because most of the Targums say, you know, uh, Melchizedek, that is Shem the Great, you know, appears and and blesses Abraham, and so yeah, so those that that's what I think is going on in uh, in the rewritten Bible texts. Um, we worked on those a lot in, in my graduate work uh, at Notre Dame. Um, in fact, my first uh, doctoral seminar paper was on 4Q rewritten Bible, uh, one of the one of these texts. I think they're post-biblical. Um, I don't, you know, some scholars say, oh, they're pre-biblical. Like this is this is the Bible in the making. Uh, I I did not see evidence of that. Um, and uh, th there's this is, gets us into a different. Uh, line of questioning, but uh, there, there's a lot of signs of the antiquity of so many biblical books. Um, the, the Pentateuch as a whole, for example, uh, does not reflect any of the developments in the people of Israel from David on. You know, there's nothing in the in the in the books of Moses about Jerusalem. Um, there is the prophecy of. Uh, the, the king from the line of Judah, but that's about it. Um, and uh, not, neither the temple nor Jerusalem are ever mentioned in the Pentateuch. And this is a real problem for uh, secular scholars that want to make the Pentateuch so late in the, in the history of the people of Israel. It just does not agree with, uh, with, with uh, uh, the, the history of, of the holy people. And, uh, and again, too, the language of the prophets, like the language of Jeremiah and Ezekiel, we can show pretty convincingly, I think, that that is uh, Hebrew that goes back to that time period, to the 500s BC. We have enough texts uh, external to the Bible to compare the language of Jeremiah and Ezekiel to uh, that we can date those books very strongly. Jeremiah and Ezekiel are already quoting the books of Moses. So that means the books of Moses have to be older yet than those prophets um so uh so yeah um uh the, these um these texts that we have in Qumran i think they are post biblical uh targum like uh yeah and for our listeners the targums are again like amplified bibles where the the hebrew which was already a dead language for most jews uh really you know going back quite quite early to you know to the to the return from babylon to a certain extent uh and then and then just as it was so to speak got worse as 
uh, more and more the people, the Jewish people living in the land of Israel no longer spoke classic biblical Hebrew and spoke instead Aramaic, which is a closely related language, but was more widely spoken in the Near East. And so in the time of our Lord, for example, the language that Jesus is speaking with his apostles would have been what we call Aramaic uh, or Syrian, again, closely related to uh, Hebrew, like Spanish and Italian are, are closely related to each other, um, almost mutually intelligible. But, uh, but again, the, um, the language of the Bible became more classical and more like a dead language, like Latin to us. And uh, so think of modern Italy, people are speaking Italian, but, you know, the Vulgate's written in Latin. Well, for in the, in, in the time of our Lord, the people were speaking Aramaic, but the Bible was in, you know, old Hebrew. And so they wrote popular Bibles that could be easily read by contemporary Jews, but they didn't just translate from the classical Hebrew to the spoken language. They included a lot of their tradition into that. And uh, so that you you had this this you know tradition and scripture combined in one writing, and uh, those the, we have several different copies and editions of that, and those are called the targums, um, and they they are a valuable source uh, showing uh, you know what the ancient Jewish interpretation was of of uh, the Old Testament.